Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Steve Boggs. I'm the Dean of the Division of Physical Sciences, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone here to the kickoff event for UC San Diego's Alumni Weekend. Woo! <laughs> Alumni Weekend is the culmination of a year's worth of meaningful experiences to help deepen the relationship between alumni and students, faculty and the community, and the, um, and the greater UC San Diego community. And over the next four days, we will host mass, uh, multiple campus events, programs, and reunions. We love celebrating all of our alumni. This weekend, we'll be honoring five talented alumni who have achieved incredible success throughout their careers. This afternoon, you'll hear from one of them, DJ Patel. DJ graduated from Warren College in 1996 with a degree in mathematics. He is best known as the inaugural data, um, chief data scientist for the White House, serving under the Obama administration. He is also very well known as the co-coiner of the term data science. And I won't go into much detail here, because you'll be hearing from DJ in just a moment. But I just wanted to share one thing uh, I found really interesting. In a recent Triton Magazine interview with DJ, he talked about the boundless nature of UC San Diego's approach to education. Because majors aren't tied to undergraduate colleges, DJ took any class he found interesting while he was here at UCSD. Because he was a Warren student, he took psychology and theater. His approach was always, take as many classes as you can, because when else in life do you have such an opportunity to try things? The college, UC San Diego, is permission to try. Today, you'll hear more about DJ's experiences in a conversation with Brad Wojtek, Assistant Professor of Cognitive Sciences. We'll have time at the end for question and answers, so uh, take notes and get your questions ready. Please join me in welcoming home DJ Patel. DJ? There we go. I keep losing. My wife and I settle our, all arguments with rock, paper, scissors, and I've been on a losing streak, so I don't want to do that. <laughs> all right, so okay. welcome back. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I took a lot of classes in here. <laughs> yeah, I taught, I've taught classes in here. <laughs> We're going to get you back here so you can teach classes. Um, so OK, all right. <laughs> no comments. Let's, let's, we're, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> So let's let's start let's start there. I right? know. Okay. So you you've you've had many different paths uh, in your career. That's such a gracious way of saying that I can't <laughs> hold on to a job. Well, we talked about this yesterday, right? There's a difference between being unemployed and unemployable, and you are That's currently true. unemployed technically, but I have a strong feeling that you are not unemployable. I am looking for a job. Um, <laughs> you know, we might have space in my lab. I don't know if you. <laughs> so. Uh, how did you, what is that path? Yesterday we talked about, with a group of students, we talked about that movement from, okay, let's figure out where you want to be, and let's work at backwards from there, the steps that you have to take in order to get there. All right, so let's work backwards with you right now. So you were the chief data scientist for Obama, and from my understanding, you were a little bit reluctant to even take that position, right? What happened? Uh, that is true. So uh, walking back, uh, which is kind of a parallel track, there's uh, a position also called the U.S. It's this, giving a little bit of feedback. So uh, there's a position called the US CTO. And uh, the, the, in that process, the White House had called and said, hey, you should put your hat in the ring for this role. And I said, why would I do that? Uh, uh, and they said, well, it's really good. And, and we, we need your help. And so you should do that. So I did put my hat in the ring. Um, they turned out there were three candidates. Uh, I did not get the role. Uh, the good news is that the two other candidates that were chosen are uh, two of my best friends. Uh, so we kind of got to say, like, oh, this is a really great job and, and choice of people. So I said, great, I'll help you from afar. And uh, I will, uh, I will, I'm not really uh, suited for this right now because we're in the middle of an acquisition, which is kind of goes back to the step before that. But... Um, uh, they said, okay, we hear that. And then a couple weeks later, I got a call that said, the president would like to meet your wife. Uh, <laughs> now, that's, that's how you know they're playing, that's how you, that's how you know you're, they're playing dirty. Uh, so we negotiated that the 
and it was an off the record kind of conversation. Uh, there would be no uh, publication of the fact that we met, and over which the president, and my wife, decided to negotiate what I would be doing for the president. <laughs> <laughs> so, somewhat influential conversation. Yeah. Well, it, it is literally like the, the President Obama is there. I'm here. My wife is there, and they're negotiating about me. It feels like. <laughs> <laughs> do I get a say? No. <laughs> you get to do the job. But the, uh, and, and it was, you know, the, the part about it is, 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 I'll tell you my greatest regret. My greatest regret is how long it took me to say yes. Because when you have the opportunity to serve and you have the opportunity to have a team that is aligned to accomplish mission, it is something that is an amazing opportunity to directly change and impact the the lives of people, and we can talk more about some of those things. But You've been pretty vocal about that. You've been vocal about the idea that people in technology, people in the sciences, there should be a, a service component yeah. for, for the United States, for the world at large. Right. Uh, how do you see that as something moving forward that can happen here through the Data Sciences Institute at UCSD, and also just more largely within the United States? Well, let's just take data science for a, a second. And, and I think what you first have to think about what rarefied opportunity we have to just literally be in these seats. You know, this is one of the most beautiful locations on Earth. Uh, uh, you know, where else can you lift weights while being in Remac while looking over the ocean or play basketball uh, with sunset uh, over the, the cliffs or you know, walk through the groves? Uh, you're also around phenomenal talent that is you know, really curated from the top faculty all the way through to uh, the students and all of you. That's, that's an incredibly rarefied opportunity. There's also simultaneously a world that sees an invisible fence around this campus that they don't have an opportunity. We see this as, we see a building, we say, ooh, what's in that building? They see a campus and they say, I don't belong. Right. So what's our job? Is our job to pontificate down to those people? Or what can they teach us? And I think we need to take an approach of what can they teach us. We often want to work with social media data, like Twitter data, and, and these kind of other systems. What would it look like? Oh, yeah, totally. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving all sorts of weirdness. Is that me? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, yeah. OK, that's not me. All right. It's not me. That's what they say always, yeah. Right. All right, how are we doing now? Better? Sweet, OK. That was my fault, because I adjusted that poorly up in the room, apparently. <laughs> I do not know how to do this. Oh. oh I do I mean, uh, <laughs> maybe? All right, we'll, we'll see. So uh, the, the, what I think is, uh, it, oh, maybe. Just back up mic right by your feet. Oh, back up mic, OK. Clip it off. Turn it off here. here. All right, you sit over here. I'm going to sit over here, OK? <laughs> there we go. All right. I love this redundancy. This is like, <laughs> kudos. T AV team is like, like they thought of everything. I'm sweet. Tweet for you. That's right. <laughs> uh, you're not Russian. <laughs> you can't get in that phone. <laughs> Too soon? Too soon? I thought you guys had beer outside. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. The greatest fear. Well, but so look, back to my rant. <laughs> <laughs> but think about this, like everybody wants to work with social media data, but look around our campus. You know, if you go down, down the streets and the opportunities and the places where technology could truly be transformative, a food pantry, educational systems, uh, other systems where things just don't feel optimal, bus schedules, transportation, finding ways to get people into opportunities. What would happen if our data science programs and all, we brought the full force, the full force of UCSD to solve local problems. Local problems here in our community that are within 25 miles radius instead of just you know, looking at some arbitrary social media. That's the data science problem that I would love to see people work on. And I think that's where we'll see the real transformation and the real opportunity here. Well, we're trying to take that into the entire program here. Right? So, uh, our is here. Hey. Right, so the, the, whole, the whole final project for my intro, my data science and practice class, is uh, 
trying to convince students to use City of San Diego data mm -hmm. uh, and analyze those data to address questions of civic and social good, right? Uh, and so this is something that we want to try and build. Now, I want to go back, though, and uh, I think it was Jeff Hammerbacher, right? You're, you're the, the co-coiner with you, right? The, the, greatest, the greatest minds of our generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click on ads, yeah. and that sucks, right? So how do you see, how do we lure people away from the money of Silicon Valley and towards the not as affluent uh, nonprofits and civic and social good uh, data science movements? So I think the interesting part about that is that all the people that Hammerbacher was talking about when he said, you know, who's helping people click on ads, look at where they've gone. So myself, I've gone on to do all these other problems which are about as far from clicking on ads as possible, most notably spending time in healthcare and criminal justice and social justice. Jeff has gone on to take a role at Cedar, Mount, uh, Mount Sinai, uh, uh, sorry, Cedar Sinai, yep. uh, to work on cancer. Uh, Monica Rigatti is, was working on uh, wearable sensors and trying to understand health that way. You look at Jeff Huber, who was at Google, is now found, uh, kind of driving Grail Bio right. in the cancer space. Uh, color genomics. Uh, yourself, who went from Uber back to the realm of academia, leaving incredible amounts of wealth on the table <laughs> to do this kind of job. But, but. <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not soon enough. <laughs> but the, the part there is what, what, what is driving everybody? You know, when we first all kind of came to this problem, the, really the only problem set that was really available was the ad-driven mm -hmm. marketplace. Yeah. What we've all been able to do is say, hey, well, these problems actually have a lot more ability to have impact everywhere else. So let's take our skills, let's take our passion, and let's apply them in those areas. And when we take our passion and our skills in alignment with opportunity, that's where truly remarkable and transformative things happen. So I actually see it as the, the, what, what data science is about to change. And you will see this dramatically across the board. Data science is about to trans, massively transform industries and uh, uh, disciplines in a way which we had not appreciated or we have not had the opportunity to bring this level of technology combined with domain expertise and in a unique uh, combined skill set. Okay, so how do you see the, I, I, I think that's great, right? I don't disagree. I, I like to think about data science now as computer science circa 1950s, 1960s, right? Where it used to be said that computers themselves cannot be a focus of science, right? They're a tool. So computer science is an oxymoron. It's not something that, it's not an independent scientific field. Right? And of course, it's now the number one major here at UCSD in terms of the number of students impacted for quite a long time now. I, I would like to think that data science is in the same sort of vein. But when you talk about where it can go and the kinds of impact it can have, right, there's a lot of positive that can be done there. Right? But there's also a lot of potential for problems. Right? So data privacy, ethics, uh, and all these kinds of things, accidental, uh, even on the accidental side, right? Yeah. IBM has this wonderful uh, uh, graphic, which is just a Venn diagram, which is, uh, you know, large, like big data, so it's not data science specific, but it's big data, and it's like, here's the Venn diagram for what can technically be done, what we want to do, what is ethical and legal to do, mm -hmm. right? And, and they don't always overlap, but sometimes the overlap gets very fuzzy, right? And so how do you see universities as they're like UCSD that are building these data science and analytics programs. How do you see the role of privacy and ethics? What, do you, what role do you see that playing in the shaping of these programs? Yeah. So let's, let's pause on that to first because I think it's first we, talk, we should talk about what is the opportunity ahead. Okay. Because there's a portion of opportunity which we don't talk about that also addresses part of this. And let me just give you an example. This year alone, about approximately 11.4 million Americans are going to cycle through 3,100 local jails. So 11.4 million Americans through 3,100 jails, right? Those numbers, this is not prison, this is your local jail. They will stay there on average 23 days. 95% will never go on to prison. Mm -hmm. So this is a cycling function. And so just think about the order of magnitude of that. And now who pays for that? Who is truly paying for that? because that's extraordinarily expensive. That is 
the local city. That is not federal dollars, that is not state dollars, that is local county dollars. That is taking money from a park, another police officer, a fire person, uh, uh, a teacher, you name it. That's local services that are getting sucked out. In fact, that problem is happening all across the country. Now, where is that problem? What is the root of that problem? And how could data really play a role? Well, Miami, Miami-Dade County in Florida took a look at this and they said, well, what's going on here? They also looked at data from Camden, New Jersey, and then Camden, New Jersey found out that 70% of all medical care costs come from only 10% of the population. 70%, 10% of the population. They can, in fact, identify the houses where they come from. And you start looking at it and you say, oh, opioids, drug addiction, mental health issues. And what's happening is we've taken away these support systems in our social structure, and we now just say, put them in jail. And we cycle them, and we get, get them off the street. But we don't actually solve the problem. So now your highest level of care costs are coming to that. So Miami-Dade, Florida said, well, you know what? Maybe we should get people to the right care at the right time. So what they did is they trained their officers and everyone in, in a crisis intervention, cost about a million and a half dollars. And they said, well, let's get them to the right care. And that turned out it saved them about 10 plus million dollars in the first year. More importantly, they closed a full jail. So what happens in year two, year three? Turns out they closed another jail. So two jails down. So how do you make this scalable? This, so what we realize is, oh, what you could do is you could make this scalable for the entire country. So we created the Data Driven Justice Initiative. And now it simply just says, look, let's just pass the spreadsheets between the healthcare system and the criminal justice system to identify people who are getting caught in this cycle. And let's go help them. Let's get them to the right care. It's not whiz bang AI or anything. This is spreadsheet passing. Mm -hmm. So data can have a phenomenal transformative impact of getting people to the right care because nobody is using data between silos. Now, we get into the next level of the question, which is on the other side of criminal justice, which is the one you're talking about, which is bail. And we have all these incredible products that are being put out there, and some of them, unfortunately, are having people slapping on a label that says, made with data science, <laughs> made with machine learning, made with AI. And there's nothing in there. And then where's the training set? What's the trained in? And some of these things have shown to be incredibly biased. Absolutely. And so how do we start to have that conversation of what is ethical? Mm -hmm. What is reasonable? And from my perspective, and maybe because I'm biased because this is where I trained, but I don't see any place that's better in the United States than UCSD to tackle this problem. Because when I was here, I was, <laughs> I was at Warren and I had to take ethics. And I'm grateful that I had to take ethics because it helped me think through these problems and these issues. So what, what does it start to look like? And this is the place, academia is the place where these kind of debates get to be well, thoroughly vetted, thought through with an interdisciplinary approach between the hard sciences, the you know, physical sciences, whatever we want to call it, all the way through liberal arts. So yesterday we got talking a little bit about uh, you know, computer science, we have a phrase, garbage in, garbage out, right? It's just, uh, this, is, this holds true also for data science, right? You're talking about training data, right? And so what happens uh, when you have your algorithms? If you want to try and predict, this has been done, recidivism rates in the United States based upon historical data of incarceration uh, and reincarceration. What happens when your training data is based off of data collected during times where there have been structural inequities? Right? So now your training data has trained the system uh, based upon social structures also. And so, you, you know, I think a BBC- It's called spade a spade. You're just asking about how did you create a, what do you do when you create a racist algorithm? A racist algorithm, algorithm. exactly, <laughs> absolutely. And so what, 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 how do you know? Like, I, I think this is one of the big data science questions, right? In terms of the sciences, how do you know when you have appropriate training data and how can you check for these kinds of problems? And how do we hold ourselves accountable? Exactly. So, you know, two other ones that I think are egregious in different forms. One is there's a, a training data, or there's a product that's when you come in through immigration, you have to take a picture and it wants to make sure you're not smiling too much, your eyes are open. Somebody forgot to put Asian people in the data set. <laughs> Seriously. And so there's, 
people who are there and they're saying like, open your eyes. And you're like, my eyes are open. <laughs> We're better than that. Like who, who allowed that to happen? You know, the other version of this is somebody said, oh, look, we're going to have, we should have AI judge a beauty pageant. <laughs> of course, beauty pageants have never had a race issue. <laughs> so what's the training set? Uh, you know, and what I would point out, and I, I put it in an intentionally provocative way, people are designing and spending a tremendous amount of investment of energy, time, technology to build autonomous vehicles. Where are you training those vehicles? Is it around Palo Alto? Is it around you know, headquarters of affluent technology cities? So is the car going to see a black person? Is the car going to see somebody who's handicapped? Who's not wearing a hoodie? Who not wearing a, it's going to recognize a hoodie. <laughs> but that's, I think we, ha we, we have to ask ourselves if we're deploying these technologies, and this is what I was joking about before, is, which is very serious, is how do we make sure that technology works for us rather than against us? And what is that structure of making sure these things are vetted, tested, evaluated, and so that we can have reliability and comfort in that while preserving the speed of development of technology so that people can benefit? Right. Uh, and and that, that combination is something that is industry can't solve alone, academia cannot solve alone, government can't solve alone. Every part has to be required in this mix. So when you were, when you were with the uh, Obama administration during that time, that you were there, uh, healthcare was a big issue for you as well. And uh, for folks who don't know, people like me, uh, if we can succeed at it, we get funding from the National Institutes of Health. Massive multi-billions of dollars a year that this, that this organization doles out to researchers across the country. And uh, when you're doing biomedical research, often you start with animal models, uh, usually mice or rats. And it wasn't until three years ago, five years ago, that it became a situation where people realized that pretty much all of the rats that were being used by design were only male rats. And nobody was really using female rats, or very few researchers were using female rats in their research. And so uh, biomedical research is built upon a foundation uh, for a long time of, of uh, testing against male rats, right? And this is also true for uh, the healthcare system in general, right? So you're talking about clinical trials. So yeah, clinical trials. You know, this idea of if you have a, a disease or something and you want to be in a clinical trial because of the type of uh, um, treatment that you want, it's, our research system is predicated on this. If you look at the people who are in clinical trials, who have access to clinical trials, it's typically because you live near a research institution like we have here, or that you're middle-aged white male. There's not the same diversity of women in that data set. There's not the ethnic diversity sets. So how do we start to make sure that we think about it that way? But maybe we need to think about it even more. And you analyze this, We, right? we analyze it. Well, it, and it turns out there's none of this. It's, 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 there's, it's a very... Uh, univariate type <laughs> type of of, of 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 population in there, mm -hmm. but the problem that I think we have to ask also is that as we're learning more about the physiology, we should also ask like what's metabolic rates, right. what are you know microbiome, all these other things, and this is actually why we spent so much energy creating something that's called the Precision Medic Medicine Initiative that President Obama announced uh, about almost three years ago, around this idea of how do we collect a large volume of data um, you know, from a million people at the genetic, genomic, environmental sensors, all that data to really understand how disease manifests and how do you create and construct tailored treatments. And, and this, is, this is what it truly means to enter the genomic era. Right now you can get, you can get your, your genome sequenced, but it doesn't mean it's going to be on file when you go to the hospital or to the provider. And, and this is one of the things, by the way, that terrifies me about what we should call Trump care is because at the first order, let's talk, just address that 23 million people would lose access to insurance. But more troubling underneath that is the issues around pre-existing conditions. And this is the idea that if you have a problem, it could be asthma, it could be a herniated disc, it could be autism, it could be you are a kidney donor, that those can be used to deny you coverage or to change the rate at which you should pay. 
But the second order implications of this are critical, specifically which if you get down to your DNA, we all have pre-existing conditions. <laughs> That's what it means to be human. <laughs> like it, so how can we live in a world where your DNA could be used against you? We do have things that the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act passed in 2008 has not been updated. So we have learned the pace of science has outpaced policy. Right. But the second part of that is think about the math that's starting to happen. There's this idea of if I have somebody that I know needs a kidney and I want to donate, but I may not be a match, but there may be another pair of people who are willing to do it and we may be a perfect match. Now, the math still doesn't work out awesome, but if you add enough people, it starts to work out brilliantly. One of the longest chains is 32 people long, all who agreed to donate their kidneys simultaneously. And they all get, have good outcomes. Amazing result. All those people have pre-existing conditions. Why would we take away the opportunity to not only enter the genomic era, but to also find the next genetic solutions. And put a national security arc on this. Who is, is going to most likely benefit from this? There's a whole slew of countries that would love to be able to take the phenomenal research institutions that we created and put them in their, on their home turf. They would love to create the pharmaceutical industry that we have, that we have built up over decades. And part of that we're seeing is large, large scale investments from those countries running the exact playbook we have, knowing that we, we have figured out the play, it's just time to execute on it. Well, so you ask, why would we not do that, right? And I think one argument could be the data that we might be giving up now that seems relatively innocuous may not, due to social cultural changes 10 years from now, 20 years from now, no longer, it may no longer be innocuous, right? And so how do we then balance the, it, let's take precision medicine as an example, right? Um, if I go to a doctor and you know, I've got a medical issue and they wanna prescribe me a drug, I don't wanna know how well does this drug work. I wanna know how well does this drug work for my condition for a mid-30s male of mixed you know, Native American and Eastern European background, right? How does it work for that? And so if I give that information up, uh, that's, that's including my genetic information, that's useful for me right now, but what are the secondary or long-term, what, what are the consequences of the digital exhaust about ourselves that we're leaving behind? So the first paramount portion of this is security. Mm -hmm. And we have to have a, a 100x improvement in security overall, of how do we secure data, how do we make sure our system's resilient, how do we're robust against attack, and, and that's a foundation. Building on top of that is privacy. And one of the things that we spent a tremendous amount of time at on at the directive directly of President Obama is to ensure two things. One, that patients and the people who would actually give up this data were always at the table during the design of these processes. So they had the ultimate say in how this went along. The second is that there had to be a very crisp process and a process that will continue to evolve as things change, a pilot phase and evolution and the policies. And so we put out very strong policy and privacy statements, uh, policy statements around trust and privacy as well as security and how that has to be implemented. The part there that I think is also fascinating is when we were working on the cancer moonshot that Vice President Biden led, one of the really interesting things is how much people actually do want to donate their data. There's when you are dealing with a terminal disease and there's an opportunity to help something, to help someone else, there's an incredible altruism that takes place that is stunning. There's a program in the VA called the Million Veterans Program and it has over a million veterans who are, uh, it's like 800,000, I can't remember the exact number, who have already donated their data, their whole genetic data, their entire medical records. And they only have one request really it's to use the data responsibly to make sure that another veteran will benefit in care. That's the only thing they want. And the key word there is responsibly. Now, responsibly has a lot of stuff baked under it. Uh, but the biggest thing is like they're saying is, and they don't even want to see the results of their data. They don't, it, which was fascinating. They don't want to see the results. They just want to make sure the data is used to help another person. It is the ultimate form of sacrifice to help another human. 
So if you are taking part in a research project like that, where you are volunteering your data as part of a study being done by a biomedical organization, be it private or governmental, then you have to sign waivers of consent. Uh, and and there was those protocols and consents are overseen by uh, IRBs, institutional review boards, who consist of members of the public, scientific community, patients, who make sure that everything is being followed ethically. Uh, now, if I go onto Facebook, and uh, when I sign up, I, you know, they have an end user license agreement, the EULA, and uh, of course it's you know, 40 pages long and uh, everybody reads every single page. And they Always. absolutely Twice. are clear about what it is that they're giving up. Yeah. Uh, and companies just get to write that on their own accord however they want, and they could update them at whim. Do you see the need potentially in the, in the near term, midterm, or long term for an IRB equivalent like scenario for private organizations that are collecting these huge amounts of data? Well, let's first talk about the IRB, because IRB actually has two unique challenges. And there's something that constitutes the IRB with, that sits over the IRB. For those that are in the medical field know about this. It's called the common rule. And the common rule is not so common. Because I don't know who, <laughs> maybe somebody will be able to tell me why it's called the common rule. I never was ever really able to find out. But it basically creates a structure. And the IRB, uh, on, uh, the structure of the IRB and all these problems have not been updated in more than a decade, almost 15 years. And so we put a process in motion during the Obama administration that was to revamp the common rule and update it. And this shows one of the problems, what happens if you do not update regulation very often. It, you have to update this stuff much more frequently because what happens is people build around it and build all these processes. And then it becomes a huge effort to kind of revamp it. And the sociologists say, ah, that doesn't work for us. And the clinicians say, that doesn't work for us. And they all have really good, reasonable answers. How do you make it fit for everyone is tough. One of the biggest problems about institutional review boards is data mining. It is the classic approach to data is if, if I go to the institutional review board and say, I'm not sure what I'm looking for, but I have an awesome data set, that's not allowed. You're supposed to look for a particular problem. I'm supposed to find a solution around, say, uh, kidney disease. But what if instead of looking for kidney disease, I find something phenomenal about schizophrenia, just because I you know, stumbled across it? Uh uh uh. You weren't supposed to do that, not okay. That is an insane proposition in this day and age. It's just not okay. So how do you balance so, discovery and, and- So we need that, what a big part of the role of consent and how do you have broad-based consent right. while making sure that this, these work is digestible. For those that care about this, the person who has probably done the best work on this is John Wilbanks. He's the one who actually designed much of the, the, the uh, uh, agreements and consent flows for Apple's research kit. Uh, he's at Sage Bio Networks. And so the, making this stuff very digestible. Now that gets back to the question of what should consumer internet companies right. do? Yeah. The bigger question I think which is, is there is how do we make sure that institutional review boards or the oversight process by which we are doing things in industry have that same level of scrutiny to make sure that there's ethical considerations? Maybe not even the same level. But, but some but, well, some, some level at least, <laughs> some transparency exactly. of what's happening with your data, how is it used, mm -hmm. and if the companies aren't careful, what will happen as we're seeing in forms of, of privacy policy in Europe is that is going to get come down as regulatory and that will, actually, that will actually limit the development of technology. So we have to find a much better balance and the whole thing about the classic you know, 40 pages of legal document, Companies have to make sure that that's much better digestible. There are certain er efforts where people have done a substantially better job. Uh, you know, Facebook has started to kind of put a privacy banner that says, hey, we want you to understand right. what this means. Right. So good efforts there. Let's see a lot more of that. I would love to see a lot more of that. But I sorry to belabor this because I think this is something really important. We should all really recognize it. We love to really look at the Facebooks and the other kind of classic consumer internet companies as, as an example of, of where data and sort of look at that. That's important. I don't want to, don't take this as me letting them off the hook of this. But I want to also call out those that collect data that we don't see and we don't know about. And they're going through and just getting data and they're scraping data. There's people, uh, you know, just kind of going through legal records, trying to put stuff. And you don't get to see them and you have no recourse. In evictions, there is a tool that renters basically can, or uh, landlords can go get, and if you're put on this list, you know this this blacklist, you're never able to to get a housing again for anybody else that lives, uses it. 
How do you get on that list? How do you get off of it? How do you see it? Credit so, scores. Well, well, the problem is you as a, as a person who might have been evicted for one of any end reasons, you have no recourse. So how do we make sure that level of transparency is there? Because that dramatically impacts someone's life now, and you never get to see the data that went into it. Right. And, and that's, that's a n equally important, in many ways more important, because you, we don't even know what data they have. Nor the proprietary algorithms that they're using to make Th that's decisions. That's right. So, OK, this has been pretty. And that's data brokers and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a whole industries based on this, right? So, OK, pretty heady stuff so far. I want to go back for a second and ask you a lighter question, which is, what is your <laughs> this heavy stuff on today's news? <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite? What is your favorite anecdote and story from your time in White House? Uh, my favorite story. Uh, or let me rephrase. What is what is the best day? Do you have like a best moment? Something that just like you were really proud of that made you smile and made you happy to be doing the job that you were doing? That stands out. Uh, I'll tell you one that made me smile and one that made me cry. Okay. So uh, the president receives letters every day. Uh, president Obama got 10 letters every night. Uh, I got access to those same 10 letters, and I got to read them every night. Every day you would see something that would make you smile and laugh. Kids would draw pictures, and there were heart-wrenching stories. One of those letters is from a woman named Jennifer Bittner. And Jennifer has stage 4 metastatic uh, cancer all throughout her body. She's been on uh, a very aggressive form of tailored treatment, uh, a form of uh, precision oncology. And she was doing great. She's doing great. Um, she had a, a son through a surrogate. She just had another son on the way through a surrogate. Um, she's been doing great. But she wrote in to President Obama to say, you know, the arc on which science is moving, I don't get to see my son ride a bike. I don't get to see him be in a class play. Said, but I know what the potential of science is and what the potential if we decided to do this is. And that was a moment that I remember reading this letter and thinking, you're tired. It's you know, 12 PM in the White House. And what is the job that you're supposed to do? You're tired. You're hungry. It's rough. And there's a person on the other end of care that needs help. In fact, there's a lot of people. And it's our job to suck it up and start figuring out how to do it. And that's when we really started to come together with the cancer moonshot. Same problems that Vice President Biden saw with his son passing away. You know, the other side, you see these phenomenal moments. You know, there's this, uh, there's this young girl, Tilly. And she, uh, she has a birth defect where she doesn't have her, really have her uh, forearms. But she has a robotic arm. And there's a picture that I posted where she's holding up my notebook from the White House. And she's able to have this dexterity because she has a prosthetic device that has this incredible touch. And she's a superhero. And I look at kids like her, and she's literally like this tall. And I look at her, and I say, the world feels like it's rough and it's tough. And here's this girl that just knows how to rise above it. And she does it with grace. She does it with elegance. And she shows us how to be a better person. And the things that are remarkable about the White House is if you look across this incredible nation, more than 300 million people, look across this nation, there's an incredibly amazing cadre of stories that just are phenomenal of people who do remarkable things. And what we often do is we sort of do it as a nice chicken soup for the soul moment rather than asking how to can we jump in and help them? And how can we do more? And what if we brought the full force, the entire full force of the United States of America to a problem? If we wanted to bring and solve the problems of cancer, what would it look like to bring the full force of the United States of America? If we wanted to solve climate change, what does it look to bring the full force of the United States of America, all of us together fighting for a problem? We did that. We put a person on the moon. We did that. We figured out how to sequence the human genome. We have an incredible track record. And the people who drive this are the students. 
We often think, oh, it's some faculty with a brilliant idea. No, the faculty gets to put the name on the paper. <laughs> it's like the awkward laughter. <laughs> I was like, ha ah, yeah, yeah, that happened yesterday. It's the students that drive this. It's the students that make this happen. You're the ones that are the engine for this innovation. And that's, we took the, we, for two years in a row, the United States of America has won the math Olympiad, something we haven't won since like the 80s or something incredible. 30 years we hadn't won or even gotten close to winning. Two years back to back. You know what the big change is? We made it fun. They have a coach, Poe, who likes to make it fun, inspirational. It's, it's unbelievable. We had two young girls at the White House Science Fair, four, sorry, six and eight. They launched a toy cat, not a real cat, a toy cat into space. <laughs> two girls. And, with what? And, with a helium balloon. And they videotaped, they, they did a GoPro, they taped it. They, I mean, it was unbelievable. And they figured out all this stuff, mostly on their, the dad helped a little bit, but it was really these two kids. There's this, uh, I mean, this, this is the power that I wish every person could see what really is, is the, the opportunity that, that happens in the White House. And to, I'm not gonna even remotely argue that, uh, you know, as a, somebody writing a lab that I don't read the paper. I, 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 the first time I see the papers is uh, almost when it's in a finished form, <laughs> looking over at my student. Um, <laughs> you and I, uh, we've talked about this, didn't have the most exemplary undergraduate careers. And one thing that helped us tremendously was our mentors. Students, I feel right now, especially in, in my data science classes, they say, what is the point of taking a class at a university when I can learn these things online, right? And what that, I mean, that, that, that leads to soul searching as a faculty member. You say, what is the point? Why, why, right? And one thing that, I, that research universities like UCSD can provide is uh, not only face-to-face -face mentorship during office hours, but also a space to bring students to learn hands-on research. Right? And for me, that was the big changing point in my undergraduate career. Right? And so we talk about education uh, uh, is mentorship. And you talk about uh, finding ways for people uh, in the data sciences to do some kind of service. Right? Uh, are there mentorship opportunities for people, I mean, not just here at a university like this, but how can students, how can people who want to break into the field, how can they, how can they give, is there a, you know, uh, data without borders? Like, wh what are the opportunities for people if they want to start doing this? So the first part about that is what I, what I firmly believe is one of the greatest value propositions of a university is you learn how to be part of a team. Mm -hmm. You learn how to work with others. Uh, you know, two of my roommates are here, George and Marsha. And one of the things that you learn is you learn about different perspectives, different life stories. And one of my challenges that I, I think is there with the online curriculum is it's not what you learn during class. It's what you learn all outside of class. It's what you learn during the long walks while you're in pain walking to the grove but sharing a story with a friend. Maybe you're the person helping them. Maybe they're the person helping you. It's the times that are tough, especially as we head into finals week, and you're kind of staring <laughs> at that you know, when the sun goes down in the library and you can see it goes from the view outside to the view of yourself, and it's sort of this existential moment, you're like, who am I? Who are you? <laughs> Been there, right? <laughs> that, that, is, that is the darkness that the, your friends help you pick you up from. And, and that is what really makes it that team sport. And I think the online communities do a reasonable job of proxying that, but there's a human aspect. This is the same way why, why AI is not going to replace a physician, because you can't replace a hug. You can't I fix I don't know if I've ever things. gotten a hug from my doctor, but. <laughs> get a new one. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get the right practitioner. I guess so. What is that specialty? I don't even know. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, a, it's a human touch. The, the part also about mentorship, of how you get into these spaces and everything, is if you don't have a mentorship opportunity, it doesn't matter. What you need to have is you need to create a team and put people together and start working on something. And when you do that, people gravitate 
to people who are enthusiastic, who have energy. If you want to work on systems of, at the local government level, there's a great group called Code for America. There's Data Kind, which is working on a whole bunch of other problems. There's, uh, there's Bayes Impact. There's a number of these. There's Data for Social Good out of Chicago, which actually we can talk a little bit about, where they did some phenomenal work around officer-involved shootings and excessive force, use of force, and how to use AI to address some of those issues. The, this, this, the biggest thing, though, is raise your hand and learn how to ask for help. We, are, we love to project this tough mentality of like, we can survive through any obstacle. The best people all know how to ask for help. And, and asking for help is a sign of, of, of not only courage, but maturity. And if you think you know, in, the, in the West Wing or in any portion of the White House, you ask for help all the time. You know, if I have a question on something, I get to ask for help and say, does anybody know how to do this? Or who should I ask? Because your job is to talk to the best people in the world to go figure it out. That's the power. And, and then when you start asking for help, somebody will say, oh, I actually know somebody. And it develops over time. I agree. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, 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 is, that is for, my, for me how, how I ended up actually graduating from undergraduate. It's how we it's met. I mean, we, we met. met and said, what are you struggling with? What right. am I struggling with? I said, oh, right. I read your blog post about how you're doing CVs and you put all the stuff that you failed at CVs. I said, that's a really cool <laughs> idea. I wonder if we could put that into LinkedIn. And then we kind of talked about it. And we share things. And we've, we've been you know, sharing ideas ever since right. because we happened to be randomly at this weird event where it was like kind of like Camp summer for camp for like adults <laughs> where you talk about science and yeah. technology. But we've stayed in touch ever since. Yep. So you're talking about. That sounded totally weird. Didn't it, it, it did. No. <laughs> no, it was cute. We camped together on a lawn. It was yeah. adorable. Um, so, in, in that sense, you have these opportunities available to the students. Uh, now, the strength of online education is, of course, accessibility for people who normally wouldn't be able to come, right? Is there a way to scale that mentorship experience? in a way for people who normally wouldn't have access to it. Uh, so it, it actually, it's a phenomenal opportunity. I think it's a great question. How do we do it? So a couple things. I think we were just, uh, we had the opportunity to speak with um, a small group of students. And one of the things we talked about is how do we bridge this incredible divide in our country? We have this divide? wave of anti-intellectualism. <laughs> <laughs> People don't believe in climate change. They don't believe in the science. We have a, these incredible debates. And isn't it interesting that it's very easy to sign up to go do an exchange program in another country, but it's hard to go figure out how to do a quarter or a semester in Mississippi or Louisiana or downtown Chicago? Like what would happen if we started to really reach out and sort of say, you know what, I'm going to actually jump into your community and you come and jump into our community and let's see what that delta is. And can we bridge it? And can we create the different mentorship models where we say it's not a mentorship of hierarchy, it's a friendship, it's a collaboration where we're sharing between ourselves and new things. Maybe there's people who don't even realize that some of these technologies are out there. Maybe there's some of us that don't realize the community support systems that have been evolved around the church and other religious groups. I think there's a phenomenal opportunity for us to see different walks of life that don't exist because of where we regionally live or through our different political ethos. That's a really, that's a really great point. My, my, my dad, up until last year, my dad and his wife, they ran a cafe in a town in Nebraska of like 300 people. And so uh, I never had a chance to visit because it's, uh, I have two kids and uh, there's no real way to get out there. But uh, talking to them about, uh, about their town and about their cafe, right? uh, about their money, how they, how they earn money, right? and you start to, uh, I would have these conversations a little bit with them and, and with my wife about like, how, how, does it, how do you make this work and how do you, is there anything that like my skill set would even remotely be useful for, right? Like my dad's been a, a cook uh, his whole life. Is there anything I could possibly do when they're having a hard time to help out? And you know, you're just sort of left there thinking, I don't think data science can solve this, right? Uh, but 
you're saying maybe there is an opportunity here. Maybe not for a situation like helping out uh, making money at like a cafe, but maybe helping out uh, at the broader scale at the community level. Yeah. How do you, what is your vision for that? How do you see that working? I think that the vision is literally taking the best and brightest and air dropping them in to communities <laughs> and letting them really live there and explore it. And, and can I give you an example? Yeah, please. Very concrete one. So after the officer involved shootings in Ferguson and uh, Baltimore, we really asked, started to ask ourselves, what could we do? And the natural thing is you say, why would the chief data scientist be involved or helping with that? And we had brought together a whole bunch of police chiefs and other technologists and civic activists, and we put them in a room. And this, one of the rooms that I, uh, we put them in is the Cordell Hull Room, which is the room in which Cordell Hull and Marshall uh, decided to save Europe. And when you talk about the history of like what we decide to do as a country and what you can do, and we said, surely we could do something here. And one of the things we realized is, well, what happens if we send some really great technologists in and have them ride along with police departments and as well as the city activists and ask what happened? And so we got a team that went in from University of Chicago to a team uh, that went into the Deep South, and they started looking at this question of why like, how do you start detecting signal when an officer might use excessive force? Mm -hmm. And so they started doing the basic kind of feature set selection, extraction, all the type of classic uh, data science things. And what they learned very quickly was there's a, a signal and noise problem. There's a few that are bad apples, but most are good. And so you got to kind of take care of that. And the, the features that describe a bad apple is very easy. They have a lot of accidents. They have a lot of complaints, those type of things. And then you kind of go down the list. And about middle two-thirds of the way down the list, there shows up these two interesting signatures. One is you've responded to domestic violence where a child is present. Second one is that you've responded to a suicide. Because these data scientists were riding along and really spending a lot of time directly with the officers, they weren't some abstract you know, area you know, just working on the computers. They were really partnered with these people. They said, oh, we know what's going on. You go to a suicide. It's extremely physically messy. It's emotionally messy. Domestic violence, child present. It's incredibly volatile. And then the officer finishes, writes up the stuff, and they get sent right back out on, by dispatch, back on the street. And they pull somebody over, they're flippant. Has the officer had any time to decompress? Where has technology failed? Because isn't it remarkable that we can do dynamic route allocation for packaged goods? <laughs> yeah, like we can get it to you in a day. But our technology isn't helping an officer. Chief Brown, uh, um, who was a leader when five officers were killed in Dallas, five outstanding officers were killed in Dallas, he pointed out, we're asking our officers to do too much. We have some bad officers. We have to address that. We have to address community policing. We also have to address how do we make sure that technology is putting people in the right position. And if they can figure that out. We're taking them out of the wrong position. To take them out of the wrong position. How, we can take better care of all of ourselves and win simultaneously. That is a solution that I never saw coming. But I think they did only after they spent time and they were really living in the community. And we've seen the exact same thing that's happening on transparency on policing around how do we share data to ensure community policing that, that works you know, both ways. So I've had plenty of time to talk to you about this stuff one-on-one -on -one, uh, and in various scenarios. I don't want to take all of your time. There's a whole bunch of people here, and I'm sure they have a lot of questions. So uh, how about we open up? Sure. So please make your way down to the microphones if you have a question. You can take them and not uh, queue up over here or right here by this mic as well. And if you could introduce yourself just briefly before you ask your question. Hi again, DJ and Bird. Um, I just had a question uh, with regards to, it's kind of like a data collection question. Uh, my name's Leander, I'm an undergraduate freshman, uh, Warren College we'll group represent. <laughs> Someone said introduce you yourself. <laughs> um, so I was recently at a genomics conference where they discussed that 90% of the data comes from less than 10% of the population. Um, that hits me more on a personal level because as a South African, I understand that we don't have the resources available as you do in this country. Um, and you've mentioned before that the training sets that we use to create things like medicine and to develop solutions to problems are 
biased to a certain demographic. How would you recommend we resolve this issue moving forward? Because you've spoken a lot about how Americans can come together, but how do we bridge the gap between people from Africa, people from India, people from the Middle East? How do you, how do you recommend we go about that solution? I think you're calling out an incredibly important aspect, which is how do we internationalize this to make sure we think about all humans, not just Americans, but all humans. You know, one of the things that I am proud to see is that under our efforts with Cancer Moonshot, the team was collectively able to negotiate a number of treaties that allow data sharing for anybody that uh, the, the, the countries that signed on to be able to really move data to the researchers so we don't have to think about, well, how, how should this work and we're at the right file formats. As we get into the pharmaceutical space, I think we have a, a, a much bigger conversation that needs to be had of how do we deploy trials, where do we do that, how do those populations also simultaneously get the benefits if they're the ones where data is being, they're being tested on uh, in the clinical trials, how do we make sure that consent has the same levels of consent and appropriate uh, uh, safeguards that we see everywhere else. And, and I think we have to point our, we have to look very hard in the mirror ourselves. You know, we we like to lo hold ourselves up as the United States of America. We are the, we did have the Henry Lax uh, issue, mm -hmm. and we have also had Tuskegee, and we need to own that. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to meet the, uh, the Lax family, and Do you want to say explain thank you. The so Henry the Lax, Lax family, it, it, so there's a stem line that comes from Henrietta Lax, and. She never, there was never really a form of consent for her to use this. She, she had a very specific stem line. There's a great book and... Uh, uh, um, the Immortal uh, Life of Henrietta Lacks. Uh, Immortal Life, thank you. Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And it's a phenomenal story about how this happened and what took place. There's a great Radio Lab episode right also on this. And uh, how do we make sure like that, that really we take care of everybody and their, their kin? Uh, as a result of this. I think we're still in a lot of these, uh, the, these are early phases of this. And I would hope that people build off of our work to do substantial, substantially more in this area. Uh, and I think that's a great question and an opportunity for everyone to come together and start asking those hard questions across all the, the countries, uh, especially from the academic centers. My name is Sayan. Actually, I'm working as an operations analyst in a legal firm. Uh, basically, it's a, comp it's a medical record retrieval legal firm. So during your uh, lecture, the one thing that you came up with, the privacy issue. So basically, it's a HIPAA thing that uh, usually puts a block on accessing the data. And uh, nowadays, uh, working with the insurance firm, the problem that I found out is it's very imperative and necessary for the different clients to have a customized insurance plan for them because one insurance plan might work for someone but the other one may not work for the other one. The thing is we need to get access to the data. And the second thing is, as you told in many of the uh, videos that I have followed, is getting an access to the local community to get their data so that I can probably work on. But the problem is the local community, especially if it's a school or maybe a police headquarters, they are a little bit hesitant in giving you the data. So my question is, how do we get an access into some of the privacy, the data which are practically private, because obviously I want to help the community, but because of these issues of privacy, I can't do it. Uh, great set of questions. So the first is on healthcare. Uh, or at least insurance, in my mind, I, I'm thinking that you're asking about healthcare. So I'm personally in favor that there should not be uh, different pricing structures for any single person. I, th I firmly believe that there should be ubiquitous healthcare for everybody, and everyone should have the opportunity to participate and receive the best singular care possible, uh, and full stop, just that they should. The second part of your question that is also, I think, there is how do we get buy-in from communities to actually provide the data? And I think one of the things we're really good at is asking for the data without also saying what do you get in return for the data? And what I, I think is the model for data exchange is that trust is consistency over time. So we can't just ask for all the data. We have to start with some little bit of data, and we have to do it in partnership with the community. And that may mean more than just saying, hey, look, I'm the data scientist, I'm here. It's actually really living in that community, working with that community, building up that system, a model of how to build it jointly with the community, where you're partners, not subservient one to the other. And as you're doing it, how do the results benefit the community first? 
It's their data. In the same way, healthcare data should be your data first. You should have access to it. And under HIPAA, you're, sp uh, uh, you're supposed to have access to that data. You know, that is, that is the law of the land. Uh, and and it, it, it's, you should have the ability to move it to another physician if you need to. Now, that's the law. You have access to it, especially under medical records. It's still not easy to move. And so we need those technologies to get substantially better to do that. Uh, one of the reasons why is people want a fiefdom and a wall around their data to protect it for their own business interests rather than providing the best product possible and ensuring the highest quality care so that you would never ever consider leaving because it's such a great experience. And I think if we approach the product in a way where we ask what is the quality of service, we'll see a very different approach. So I tell people is focus on the product, don't focus on the data. Focus on the value proposition that we provide and what is that exchange. I think that changes the whole paradigm. Hi, uh, Ian Daly, ERC, 2017. Um, do you support the EU's proposal or possibly even law right now about the right to be deleted? <laughs> and how do you feel about an individual's right to retract their uh, uh, approval to use their data? So they're, they're, Do you want to explain that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the EU has a whole new set of regulations. That, well, there's there's a whole been a whole series of these regulations over time uh, about what are your rights around data and what is responsibility. These include opt in, opt out, ability to be removed, and all of these things. To be able to remove yourself from Google searches. From Google searches. Right. And we're seeing one of the, the, there's places where I think this has lots of benefits, but there's also places where there's been deep problems with this, about even about being able to remove uh, information about searches where it should clearly be in the public record and people abusing those, those systems. I would prefer to see a much more aggressive policy approach that, that is an open construct between industry and uh, consumer groups that is going to have an evolutionary approach. I feel like this one is very draconian, and I would like to see one that actually has elements of this. There's um, a number of parts where I think there are very substantial protections that need to be put in place. Some of those involve, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, the case where there's a, a, a video where somebody has uh, been in a sexual encounter and somebody, the other party has posted it and they, they, they hold it for ransom or they, they kind of use it as a, as a way to tarnish somebody's image. Uh, that type of form, I think there needs to be also an outlet uh, uh, as a way to, to, for recourse to fix those type of problems. These things, I think, are only going to get amplified in different ways. And so I'm worried about that we'll f solve this problem right now in this one way. But search will change dramatically because it'll move to social search or other things. And the place where I'd really like us to focus on is this question of the algorithm, not the data. The data is really important, and, and let's not forget that. But I'm really worried about where the algorithm is, and I don't see any of that really in this, this, type, of, um, this type of legislation or the, the proposals that are there. So I feel like it's, it's, a little, it's already a little bit dated Gets tricky, right? This is where the law of unintended consequences kicks in. It's, it's right? very tricky, you and this is no a, idea what the I have a lot is. of, and, and we oftentimes think about the policies from the EU, and we say, oh, well, that's just so draconian and so terrible. But we also have to remember that people use data in very nefarious ways during Nazi regimes, you know, including just using the phone book to go through and look for Jewish names to, to identify people. So there, there are really good intentions behind this, mm -hmm. but we have to ask, how do we make that work uh, in a combined effort? And, and I think that's, that's a challenge right now to figure out what that is. And I would really like to see the consumer internet companies taking a more collaborative approach with this. Uh, and you know, this comes into the whole fake news question, this comes into a question around ISIS recruitment, uh, in, as well as uh, recruitment from uh, um, uh, uh, alt-right and white supremacy groups. I'm old Jewish kid, graduated from uh, UCSC a couple years ago. I worked with Boeing. I've been trying to break from the field recently. And first of all, what is the summer camp you guys went to? That sounded really fun. <laughs> <laughs> 
True camp. True camp. True camp. Uh, friends of O'Reilly. Uh, second of all, uh, you know how Tesla, they released their autonomous car. Is that something, uh, so there's law that autonomous cars are allowed on the road. Is that something you were consulted on about how it was trained on very specific cities and not, because it's still failing. There are videos of them failing uh, on roads today. So what is, how was it decided yeah. that they were allowed to? So that is under, there's, uh, uh, I'm not an expert in the specifics of that, but the, the, let me give you the broad start. There's the Department of Transportation, which is federal, and then there's state, which gives um, also the waivers or approvals and permits to do these things. Uh, California has had an, a, a number of discussions with this, as well as uh, allowing people to go forward and not allowing people to go forward. Uh, under the Department of Transportation, under general autonomous vehicles, including self-driving cars, but drones and other type things, there is actually this policy framework that was put forth by the Department of Transportation in very strong consultation with uh, my team, the CTO team, we're all kind of one team that way, uh, Office of Science Technology Policy, which establishes what you could call a guardrail approach, which is, Look, there's a, the, the policy that you can be over here and over here, but not over here. Uh, and that's the approach which is to go forward. And it establishes a way in which it's going to be very regularly updated. And so I would do a search for autonomous vehicle, Department of Transportation uh, policy. And, and you'll see it's a framework rather than putting in something that then suddenly is like, oh, we didn't think of that. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's a f one of the early times we've put a, a fully evolutionary technology policy process and it's one that I think we received very strong positive feedback from uh, Universal because everyone's saying how does this evolve at the speed at which it's doing. Hi, uh, my name is Michael. I graduated a year ago with a bachelor's in Cogsci from Revel. Um, this is kind of a selfish question. The I've been doing the job search. I did some, um, some research here, decided I wanted to do bioinformatics. And what I've found is that the entry level is a PhD in three years of experience. Um, my question, I guess, to make it a bit more broad is how, what's, the, what's the transition from talking about this, taking classes here, doing research here, to actually going out and doing it in the real world? Is the solution writing academia till academia is over and then hopping? Is there an entry level? Like a, is like a, I don't know, like a way, a, a tunnel under the wall of um, experience, so to speak. And I guess how, how do you get to actually solving problems? Yeah. Oh boy, I'm glad we're talking about walls finally. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> uh, Immigration is our superpower. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, so the, here's the rough cut answer is, you know, what you see on a job application and what actually it requires to take the, the job are, couldn't be further from the truth often times. So what actually happens, in, and what I think is most important, is gaining experience. And that, whether that's through internship or partnership through some other mechanism, that's the, that's the number one best way to do these things. I think that's how we kind of got into this area. It wasn't really like, ooh, well, here's an application, let's just apply for it. And somebody's like, hey, I think you can do this. And I'm like, mm, for me? <laughs> the, the part there that oftentimes is undervalued is, and what I tell people is clever beats smart nine times out of 10. Smart is how you need to scale something. And so there are different paradigms for different things. Data science, I think, right now, is optimized for a clever. And so if you find ways to think about the problem in very unique ways, you're gonna add disproportionate value. And that's where you see the, the people do phenomenally. Why do people tend to go after people with PhDs? Is because they've had to survive a PhD. <laughs> and so that shows a form of resilience. But oftentimes, if you kind of really start talking to the people, the worst way to get a job is to apply. <laughs> the best way to do it is to find out who you might know that could get you to an introduction. And that's how you really start getting people to talk about stuff. And so the traditional approach of, of, of 
going out and just talking to companies, that's, that's not the viable way of today. Find friends, find people. And this is why you leverage your social network that you have of your friends and your colleagues and start building out. And also ask people fundamentally like, hey, can I just learn what you do? Would you be willing to just let me shadow you for a little bit or just buy you coffee? The power of buying coffee is phenomenal. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, institutionalized it's, here. There's a coffee with a prof program really? for undergrads. There you go. They can get a voucher to take professors out for coffee. How many people know about this? <laughs> Whoa, impressive. Okay. Uh, people that are watching online, you should totally make sure that's happening in your community. Like, that, it's, it's I mean, great, I wish I, I, that would have been amazing. I have, I've gotten a lot of free coffee. There. That, that's, yeah, <laughs> no wonder you're caffeinated. <laughs> but that, that, that's literally the way I would do it. Is, is kind of just, like, don't play by the traditional means. Not at all. Uh, uh, that's, that's how you get in. So we've talked about this a little bit, right? So uh, in, when I began teaching the data science class here, uh, it wasn't, I, I always I struggle with students because students want to do the shiny cool thing, right? And 95% of the time in actual data science, you're not doing the shiny cool thing. You're doing the thing that everyone's been doing for a long time, which is like doing really boring data cleaning and then linear modeling. Right? And so when I'm teaching the data science classes, it's geared around fixing this issue. Right? So everybody that I've brought in as a guest speaker, and it's been like a dozen data scientists, every one of them has had a PhD. Right? And then the students, they ask this question, they say, How, you know, can I do data science without a PhD? And invariably, every one of them says, oh, well, of course, we're always looking for the best people. It just so happens that everybody has a PhD. Um, <laughs> and that, that stinks, right? And when I was on the recruiting side, I, I understand that now, right? And it's, you know, you see resume after resume after resume, and they look very, very similar. And you're like, okay, well, let's assume that we're hiring only the most four years recent worth graduates. There's like 2,000 degree granting institutions in the United States. Uh, and let's say each one of them has 100 something students. Okay, what separates you from the other 200,000 people that may be qualified for this job on paper, right? And when people would come up to me at recruiting events, there's a box and every resume goes into that box and that box gets shipped up and sent up to HR and HR goes through all of those and then they call the people that stand out through whatever metric they have. But there is my bag, which I carry with me all the time, which has my laptop in it. A handful of the resumes would go in the bag and when we're in the cab on the way back to the airport away from the recruiting event, I'm on the phone with HR saying, you gotta hire this person now before Google, Facebook, Twitter gets them. And so LinkedIn. for me, LinkedIn, <laughs> for me, the, the, the structure of the way that we're organizing the data science undergraduate major here is, in my mind, to get our students in the bag and not in the box. And how do you get in the bag? And you get in the bag by having projects that you have seen through that show your cleverness. And that's why when I teach the classes, and that's why when we design the major here, they're project-based. And they're also geared around incorporating data sets, public data sets from multiple different places to address something totally unique that couldn't otherwise be addressed. Yeah, I go to the hackathons and I go to the uh, poster sessions mm -hmm. like for these projects in the, the different ways and that's where I did most of my recruiting. I was like, that's awesome, you're in. How do I recruit you? Short follow up, can I caffeinate and or shadow either? <laughs> uh, uh, you're yes, in my lab already. But uh, I, if I'm while, in the Bay Area, in my lab I, I, I will be doing a bunch more office hour kind of models, which I'll be announcing later in the summer. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I want to come to your office hours. Sure. Hey, first, thanks for coming and spending your free time answering questions. I really appreciate it. So my name is Zank. I graduated from the Bell. I did go with a couple degrees, uh, both in engineering and full academic and called data science. I started at Abbott Labs, so I learned about R&D. Regulations and all of that entails, and I want to do a lot of defense work, and there are lots of, you know, before you open the door and make sure your phone's away. Yeah. I'll drive out of the safe and do all that stuff. And um, as a data scientist for going on 17 years now, um, I've done some projects on my own, and I, I'd love to get your feedback on them. So I'd like to describe this project to you and tell you what was so headbutting the wall, difficult about it. Um, sure, if it's brief, because they're all waiting still. <laughs> it, it's really quick. So you're, you're familiar with 30-day readmission, you know, hospital readmission. So I work on that project for a while. Um, I happen to believe that data science, by and large, is a fairly simple thing to do um, once you have the right data set. So no one's going to shake out like that. Once you know what you're doing, it's pretty easy. So we have the data. Um, we, were, we were just one block away from the door. And we had almost the ability to know we sat down with people in the hospital in Detroit, and it just came down to different lines, and we couldn't crash through that. Um, and there was just no 
away, we gave up, and my two partners were both attorneys. It was incredibly, it was insurmountable, and doing the work would have been almost trivial. The amount of money we would have saved went right into our, um, to our deck that we presented. You know, this is just ABCs of how to land a contract, and we could not do it. And I know you've got a lot to say, um, so for, oh, yeah. for everyone here just about to graduate, going out, it's easy enough to work for a company like Uber or something like this where you get the data from the data engineering, you go and do something with it. But what about the people who want to start their own things and they just can't get past all this regulation? Where the hell is that going? That's yeah. very difficult. So that's why we created the office of the chief technology officer, the chief data scientist, and that's why we also established 40 chief data officers and chief data scientist roles across the entire federal government, uh, including Department of Transportation, uh, uh, National Institutes for Health, uh, um, NOAA, um, you name it. There's a chief data scientist for all of commerce, in fact. The city to, of San Diego. The city of San Diego. That to specifically say, uh, wait, that's a problem. Now, HIPAA is a particularly challenging one because it's a law. And if anybody reads and tries to understand HIPAA, like my worst meeting in the White House was a, a top level attorney trying to explain HIPAA to me. And I was just like, <laughs> but this, I was getting so mad and I went away finally and I was like, oh, it's like a seg fault. <laughs> <laughs> this law actually like doesn't compile. Like this doesn't make sense it, because it's written in a way that conflicts. And so no wonder there's so much thrashing and billions of dollars wasted on this. So what we did is we said, okay, we're going to try, we're going to get Office of Civil Rights at Health and Human Services to actually provide clarification that makes it substantially easier to work on the readmission program. And the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are going to release data through Niall Brennan, who is the chief data scientist or chief data officer for CMS. The way do we fix this is this is where it gets important is if we want to solve these problems, those of us have to jump into the policy seats. We have to find a way to serve so that we fix the problem upstream. Because if we don't, we're going to run into this. And there's a certain ceiling that is there. And we are going to be limited unless we kind of go in and break through of that. No matter what the administration, that's the only possible way to fix that portion. So, well, there's, so there's a number of ways to serve. Uh, uh, you know, there's local government, there's state government, there's Code for America fellows, uh, there's a US digital service, uh, there's 18F, there's the defense digital service, there's a VA digital service. There's a whole bunch of these that have now been orchestrated and I believe the teams are making it easier for people to find these, these choices. If you're a grad student, uh, there, there, I think it's still required that you have to be a grad student. There's a AAAS. Uh, fellowships congressional as well as executive branch. So there's places to kind of go insert yourself and we worked very hard to now do these um, these different hiring authorities that allow you to come in and, and do that. And if you're in academia, you can go in as what are called IPAs, uh, interpersonal agreements that allow you to be shared with the government for two years, up to two years. IPA means something different in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a signal of beer o'clock. But, but that, that would be the, 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 the short gist. I'm happy to talk afterwards about more specifics of that. One. All right. I've been, now, that's a shirt. For people that don't, can't see that, that's a Camp David shirt. That is a very rarefied uh, uh, shirt to, to have. How are we doing on time? Okay. Three more questions? OK. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, Johan Lee, uh, genome scientist, about a decade ago. Uh, machine intelligence scientists last five years. Um, uh, trend number one, um, on the precision medicine side, on the federal data side, there's much more real world evidence being degenerated. On the commercial web scale internet company side, the trend is more and more of the top capabilities in data science machine intelligence are being open sourced um, to anyone in the world. Uh, the trifecta thing that I'm concerned about is state and non-state actors uh, getting a pretty quick technological leap in a very short amount of time in ways that could harm not just U.S. citizens, but citizens anywhere in a way that, frankly, just isn't very comforting. Your thoughts? Yeah, thank you for bringing this up. So uh, first, uh, another way to phrase this is how do, you, how do we manage the different technical arcs so that we make sure that we are robust against threats. 
you know, one of the ones I think that is the most pressing that we have to address is the use of artificial intelligence in what might be traditionally called cybersecurity attacks. Specifically, what we're seeing is phishing attacks, where I try to get you to take a click on a link. Those, uh, the, the content of those posts in social media are being already tuned and optimized using uh, machine learning. Uh, and so we're seeing that. Port scanning is going to move to AFI. So cyber is, and you know, non-state state actor is gonna move very quickly from first strike being non-kinetic in the cyber realm to, and eventually then traditional means kinetic being like a bomb or you know explosion or something. Uh, so that's where I'm most concerned about. The larger one where I'm concerned about with the adoption of the, the, the I'm, I'm less concerned about the open source because one of the things that we found with open source is you need an active community to work and you use that technology. Uh, and, and the benefits and the arc at speed at which we get for evolution of our science and our product performance is massive on a uh, given open source. And so if you look at other places where they're using open source, even Hadoop and the Hadoop distros, it's still pretty far off, even if you go from uh, west coast to east coast, <laughs> and then substantially uh, more as we go to other countries. That doesn't support your, your assertion if that is a true state actor and they're willing to throw lots of dollars at it. The bigger, the part that, that I, I worry about in that, that giving up that national security piece on the board is the data component. And in precision medicine, for example, what we have seen with China, the US has, has proposed to get, provide $1 billion in funding. China has proposed to do nine, uh, 9 billion and change on that. We are attempting to sequence 1 million. China is gonna try to sequence 100 million people. And so the orders of magnitude on which that data is, is there is terrifying. And, and that's why I'm so concerned about the pre-existing conditions. Because our electronic medical records, as even in the state they are in, are substantially better than anyone's outside of the, uh, the UK. Given that, we still have to start addressing this. One of the things I would love to see, especially out of the national security kind of articles, is I think we need a different form of what you might see is classically the Council of Foreign Relations or other national security papers, is we need a better hybridization of how do we train national security people to be in the model that we saw of Secretary Carter and other Secretary Perry who were technologists. You know, granted they were nuclear technologists. In this case, we need a new form of that to ask these questions. And I would like to see almost what's the next form of national security papers and articles that are being written to address this to start that debate because I do believe that we're ill-equipped to do this. The new Belfour Center that Ash Carter and Eric Rosenbach uh, are leading is going to take a first portion of that but there is a phenomenal opportunity to do a tremendous amount more here and we got to get we have to really step on the gas to get ready for it. Thank you sir. Can I can I actually ask you a follow up on that which is uh, you did a lot of work on the national security side. Uh, a fair amount, right? Uh, during your time in the White House and you you actually uh, I never heard the story. Uh, you received the highest civilian medal honor, right? From the was it the Department of Defense? Uh, from the Department of Defense. Uh, what was that for that you can tell us? Uh, so the, it, it, that probably was my personally impacted me the most event is uh, they did a surprise medal ceremony. Um, so the recipients this last year were President Obama, Eric Schmidt, and myself uh, um, in three different ceremonies. And uh, I didn't see it coming. Uh, and. Uh, there's something special about what that's for. A lot of it was for helping uh, on uh, encryption, cybersecurity issues. Okay. We set up something called Hack the Pentagon, which allows bug bounty programs for people to really attack Pentagon systems to see how, how robust they are in a safe, secure way um, and provide those vulnerabilities back to the Pentagon. So white hat? White hat hacking, very much white hat hacking. So do you think there's room for white hat data science? Uh, I do, I do, I, I, I really do. And, and I also think that there's a, a phenomenal opportunity to increase the speed of trans, transfer of technology from the research bench all the way to uh, not just the warfighter, but the, the peace activist right. and the person who is working to keep peace and to help disaster relief in all of those areas. So I don't just think of it as one dimensional. Uh, my name is uh, Noir. I graduated from uh, Warren College three years ago, currently at Qualcomm as a product slash data engineer. 
Uh, I have a couple of quick questions. First is uh, on big data. We only use like a decimal of the big data that we collect. Do you have any insights like what happens like with the garbage data that exponentially increase every day? And two is uh, about uh, autonomous uh, driving. Uh, like one overlooked aspect is the ethics of uh, autonomous driving, like who gets to write that conditional statement if you wanna like, uh, if you want your car to like kill one person versus 10 people, like who is the like uh, authority? Like is it the government or is it the like company or is it the person that programs it? Yeah. So the the is big that overlooked. Uh, I think there's um, a pretty fair amount of work going into that. I think we've actually that. put so the yeah the later one is actually the easier one because we've actually put a tremendous amount of effort around that. Right. Uh, in fact, at the uh, event which we were at, was, uh, uh, Mike Lukides yep. and, and I were the first to really say, hey, we got to get ahead of this trolley problem, which is this this question that you're referring to is how does a car who's the, the car have the responsibility for? Uh, and uh, we. There's actually been a, a sufficient amount of progress around this. We have a lot more to go. I think the bigger portion of that I'm, I'm personally concerned about is the algorithmic questions around that. And I think the questions that you're talking about start to fall out naturally around the algorithms because you're asking, who's the al who are you writing this algorithm for? And that has to start getting addressed. And so those things start to, to show up. By the way, this is why uh, one of my strong stances is that every training program in data, whether it's bioinformatics, economics, data science, statistics, has to have ethics as an integral part of the program all the way through it. You know, same with security. We can't teach database design and then not teach about different forms of attack. Like we have to have this as a holistic approach. So your question on the big data side is, no, I think this is a really interesting point because we have all this data being thrown off. We have people instrumenting even more and then we just silo it. <laughs> and then if we say, well, open it up, no one can download it. So how do we start getting our hands around it? I think the part that I would love to start seeing is people saying, hey, how can you aggregate or put this so we can work more collaboratively around this in a particular research area or a project? One of the specific examples is what's called the Smart Cities Initiative, and there's what's called the Regional Big Data Hubs. And these are different areas that are working to say, hey, if we really instrument a city, how, like, what are we going to do? And how are we going to make this work collectively? And that, those forms of data are going to be the, you know, the ridiculous amounts of data that's going to be thrown off. And those are still in the early phase, but I think there's a great opportunity. And the same is true in uh, genomic sequencing, uh, uh, gen genetic sequencing. The amount of data that's being thrown off there, and especially as you get to the microbiome, we really have to, we don't know how to think about that. And the junk data is turning out to be real. What people traditionally call junk is really important. So, do you think like we're gonna hit a wall per se, like in like our data collection? Are we like not gonna like have accessibility like in the future? No, uh, because I've I've said that too many times, and I've been proven wrong every time. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's very frustrating once you get into, into the analytics side yeah. to realize what could be done. When you look at like the city of San Diego, we have a chief data officer, Maxim Percheski, uh, and uh, he has a team of three people, I think, uh, working on analytics for the city of San Diego. And you look at something like traffic or potholes for a city, right? I drive home, uh, I stop driving on the five south uh, every day because I hate it. Uh, so I just take surface streets, which take me like 15 minutes longer, but it's more Did you pleasant. say five or the five? The five. OK. Because it's San Diego. Just checking. Um, and you know, like the traffic, everybody getting off on Balboa, and then the thing backs up for miles, right? Like if every city employee who's driving around for the city of San Diego had a, had a uh, you know, phone in the car or some sort of thing, the GPS that was like tracking the speed and position, right? the amount of data that the city could leverage just by people are just moving around doing their jobs to identify potholes, to identify traffic pain points is incredible. So there's huge amounts of opportunity that could be baked into a system incredibly cheaply that's just, it's not being collected. So we are collecting more and more and more and more data uh, and only a fraction of it's being used. But even more frustrating is the data that could be collected for almost free, uh, no extra cost, that could have huge benefits for city infrastructure and, and data vacuums. Yeah. I mean, we have to remember also there's populations that have no data signature. Right. 
And so uh, simultaneously, how could we give them the appropriate f representation with data so that we can provide services? Well, yeah, this goes back to my parents' town. That's right. Nebraska, right? Like they don't have, that, that may not exist. I, don't, I can't say for, for Red Cloud specifically it doesn't. Uh, but for many small towns, they don't have access to the resources to do this kind of stuff. And so they're missing out. And then you start to, that divide gets deeper, right, in a lot of ways. Anyway. My students are analyzing that pretty tremendously, but it turns out there's a bias. Uh, wealthier neighborhoods uh, report a lot more. One of the, are the student groups here that are analyzing that? They're, they're presenting Saturday, but it turns out wealthier, wealthier neighborhoods in San Diego report more frequently. Mm -hmm. And, and isn't, it, isn't it painful to realize that we have an app and we have ways and we may have other different things? It's all our roads. Yeah. Shouldn't we just share that form of data? Like who benefits from keeping, it's my pothole data. <laughs> <laughs> like you're gonna monetize potholes? <laughs> like what, I, I, I fundamentally believe there's a set of things like where we it's kind of like really? We can do better than that. And if we open that up in, a, in this interesting way, we all benefit. We, we all find interesting solutions as a result. Last question. Hi, uh, my name is Arya Call. I'm a second year bioinformatics major. Um, one of the main issues I see with government is that the people who make all of the decisions regarding science and technology know nothing about science and technology. And <laughs> it I is a series of tubes. It is, the internet is a series of tubes. <laughs> And I respect you a lot because you represent one of the few technically literate people who has broken into like the highest echelon of government to affect like real, you know, policy change with the kind of rational. Did I mention I'm unemployed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my question Not is. Not judging. <laughs> okay, I did. If I wanted to get to like your position, right? I mean, not the unemployed part. The, <laughs> right before that. <laughs> the, not the unemployed, yeah. Right. <laughs> what would be the best kind of series of footsteps uh, to follow to kind of affect real policy change with a rational scientific mindset? Yeah. So, so um, I think it's really important to also set the, uh, the record straight. The, the, the person who was the chief technology driver while I was at the White House was President Obama. He replaced, normally in the Oval Office, if you're facing from the desk uh, on the left-hand side, there um, was a series of dishware. President Obama replaced those with actual replicas, the patent submissions. That, like, so if you, you submit the telegraph, you had to actually submit a telegraph. And so he has the telegraph there, the gear cutter. And he put those in his office to represent the power of the innovation of the American public, and that what happens if you return science to its rightful place in the White House, and it is driven directly out of the Oval Office. And that's why you saw not just a, a substantial effort to make sure all Americans have access to the best health care through the Affordable Care Act, but the Brain Initiative, Precision Medicine, Cancer Moonshot, the White House Science Fair, uh, climate change efforts, you know, a system. John Holdren, who is the science advisor for the president, is for President Obama is phenomenal in the sense of his understanding and ability to do technology, especially the very hard physical sciences, uh, nuclear technology, uh, chemistry, uh, astrophysics. Uh, one of my favorite other moments of the White House was we had the White House Science Fair. We had everyone in the East Room, and the president, you always know when the President Obama is about to go off strip, and you're like, <laughs> it's coming. And he started to talk about LIGO you know, the, the gravitational waves. And he thought, he just went on for a little riff, literally a like two, three minute riff about how cool is it to think about the, like for a moment in time, the universe expands and then contracts just for the instant around us. And what does that mean and how do we think about that? And to see a president drive from that position is phenomenal and empower his team to do that. And, and it translated in every dimension you know, from the Domestic Policy Council to the Situation Room, and how to think about technology in all sorts of novel ways. And so that's the, the first part, is that, that it, it starts with electing leaders that have a deep understanding of technology and science. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Who's our that, next chief data scientist? <laughs> well, the second part is how do you get in position to do this? You start by getting involved with real world problems and having a perspective and sharing and trying to understand how does this work? How does that work? What is the legislative approach? What is the executive branch approach? My case, it was jump in and ask lots of questions and be around people and have the humility to say, I don't understand a single word you're saying. And for those people to say, don't worry, we'll teach you. And making sure that I spent and did the hard work on my own to go learn how to read those documents and do everything. But remember, the one thing that you have to remember that this university has done in a phenomenal way, and this is what universities really do, is they have taught you how to learn. You have the ability to go into anything. And when you sit there in that library and you're feeling that depression of like, how am I supposed to get all this material in this book into your head? Or you've graduated and you think like, well, what did I really get out of this? What you really should recognize is you have been hyper-optimized to take in diverse content, process it, and then act on it. And do it in a way that is gonna have material impact. And so if you focus on that and keep doubling down on that, you're gonna find all sorts of extraordinary ways to apply that information. And that's the part that's most exciting to me about this academic institution. Thank you, DJ and Brad. DJ, thank you for sharing your stories with us. And um, we really appreciate you representing um, physical sciences, Warren College, UC San Diego. Um, we're incredibly proud of your accomplishments. And welcome back to campus. Um, everybody who joined us today, thank you. I hope you found this as inspiring as uh, I did. And um, we look forward to seeing all of you at the rest of the alumni events this weekend. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you again, DJ.